All right, uh, Trevor, are you ready to start work? I was born ready. <laughs> Go, that's enthusiasm for you. Okay, so let's. All right, great. So our next speaker is Trevor Woolley from Purdue, who talks about shifted analogs of the divisor function. Thank Trevor, you. please. Thanks, Mel. So it's a it's a great pleasure to to be here again on Zoom. Um, <laughs> So maybe one day we'll, we'll be able to meet in New York City. Um, yeah, so uh, let me emphasize for what I'm speaking about. Um, uh, most of it is joint work with uh, Winston Heap and Anurak Sahai. And you can hear Anurak um, speak on Friday at two o'clock. So um, he'll give a talk which is related in some ways to this. Okay, so shifted analogs of the divisor function. What's this all about? So, um, <clears throat> so let's look at the shifted integers. Why not? That's an additive problem, and that's what this uh, this meeting is all about. Um, so we're going to shift the integers by um, what might be a, a complex number theta. And um, well, this possesses many additive properties in common with n. In fact, if you stick with additive properties, all of its properties are common to n. Uh, so it really is if you stick in the additive world. Uh, this is um, something that's interesting to look at. Um, okay, if you look at the multiplicative properties of this set, um, things change a bit. So that's what, what this talk was really about. Um, uh, so if theta is rational, you can imagine that um, by scaling, somehow this is related to what happens with uh, the integers. Um, if theta is not rational, then that's not going to be the case anymore. Um, so what specifically am I going to look at in this talk? Well, we're going to look at the shifted analog of a divisor function. And this generates some interesting Diophantine properties, which is where my interest um, gets into this problem. Um, so you should imagine, I mean, if theta is zero in this definition of tau k here, then this looks a lot like a divisor function. Uh, we're just looking at a product of integers um, representing a, another integer. Um, so we're shifting each of these divisors by this, this number theta. Um, and that, that makes this problem a little bit different, but this, this product still lives inside um, Z adjoined theta. So in general, it's gonna be a polynomial in theta or maybe even um, you know, some sort of polynomial of degree K in terms of theta with um, integer coefficients. Uh, okay, so... Um, so this is some sort of counting function. We can understand um, for most uh, complex numbers, nu for will be zero representations, but if we're living in z of theta, then we're gonna get um, some integer representation. Okay, and so um, the particular interest I have here is in the, the mean square of tau k. Um, just to... Um, to connect this with things that you're probably more familiar with. Um, if I take my um, box size large enough and shift to be zero, then this coincides with the k-fold divisor function. And then this mean square is just looking at the mean square of the, the k-fold divisor function. So, um, so in this context with this full range for the divisor function, this is a classical problem looking at this mean square. It grows like the length of the interval y times a power of log y, k squared minus one power of log y. Um, you can get asymptotics for this. Um, if you truncate everything, so really this box size is kind of a truncated divisor function, then the power of log changes. Uh, still positive power of log but the, um, the power changes from k squared minus one to k minus one squared. You can get asymptotics if you want by the circle method or whatever is your favorite method of attacking this problem. Um, uh, so what about um, the problem which I posed in the, um, the first slide? So, so then we've got these shifts of these integers. When we're looking at this shifted divisor function, actually just counting solutions in this mean square of a product of k shifted integers equal to another product of k shifted integers. Um, in this rational case where theta is rational, then um, this looks a lot like the traditional function. Um, 
particularly in this rational situation, then because of this presence of this log x, you can see that there are many, many solutions where um, on the left-hand side here, x1 up to xk is not just a permutation of y1 up to yk. If uh, x1 up to xk were usually a permutation of y1 up to yk, this would be dominated by growth of order x to the k. Okay, so, so now I can say a little bit about um, what these uh, shifted divisor functions in general look like. So to do this, I want to think about the number of ways that I can um, uh, a given set of integers x1 up to xk, um, where these variables are all inside some box of size x. And that's what this function tk of x is. It's, it's roughly k factorial x to the k. But there are lots of contributions from terms where some of these, some subset of x1 up to xk General, uh, you could write this down, but it's a mess. Um, and uh, I'll just recall for you what our shifted divisor function is. And then the first theorem, um, which is rather simple to, um, to establish, is that the mean square of this shifted divisor function, when theta is uh, either transcendental or alternatively, if it has large degree, degree at least uh, k as an algebraic number of rationals. So this mean square is given by um, this counting function for the, the, this, these permutations. So in other words, a set of solutions uh, are given ones where the x's are just a, a permutation of the y's. And that means that um, well, in this sense, actually all of the elements, not just almost all, but all of the elements which are represented, are uh, represented essentially uniquely in this manner. And the, the almost there is a clue to what happens on the next page. Um, I have that in my head. Um, so if you look at uh, other algebraic numbers of smaller degree, so let's make sure they're um, not rational numbers by insisting that the degree is at least two, um, but smaller than K. Then the mean square of this shifted divisor function is dominated by this permutation counting function. And there's an error term which is definitely of smaller order of magnitude. And that really does say that almost all of the solutions counted by the corresponding equation here are just the diagonal ones. Um, and you can generalize this as a, a almost immediate consequence of this result. Um, so the higher moments of these divisive functions. And again, you'll get some um, main terms, which are given by just permutations. So that shows that uh, if you have shifts in all these integers involved in the representation, then um, the situation definitely changes from that, which you see in the rational situation. Um, and um, this has connections with what I call paucity. Um, so the number of non-diagonal solutions of this equation, uh, y1 up to yk is not a permutation of x1 up to xk. Uh, the number of solutions is of smaller order than the number of diagonal solutions. This is a pretty nice situation to be in. So that just summarizes that result once again. Now let me say, you know, what, why, why should one be interested in this? Well, one reason is because maybe um, you get a, an email from a couple of other authors who are interested in this problem and, uh, and ask you about it. Um, and that actually leads to applications uh, of those authors for um, the Herbert state of function. And that's uh, what uh, Anurag is speaking about on Friday. As I said, this is also closely related to paucity problems. So numbers of uh, non-trivial solutions of different equations. And that's really where my interests lay. So I've looked at similar problems before. Um, and uh, to try to get you um, hooked into the, these paucity problems, let me let me give a you know something very concrete for which you can think about, which um, shows that this is a very concrete problem to play with. 
So let's look at the more or less the, the simplest interesting situation. Um, so k equals two is a bit too trivial. k equals three, so a threefold div divisor function. Um, let's make the shift be the square root of two. That's a, a nice irrational number. Um, and then if you if you look at the, the product of three shifted integers, you can expand it all. It all involves terms multiplied by, by one polynomial multiplied by one and another polynomial multiplied by square root of two. You can separate out those terms. And so using the linear independence of one and square root of two, um, the counting function, the divisor function, which I was interested in, um, mean square of this divisor function, turns out to just be counting solutions of a pair of polynomial equations. It's a, not a homogeneous equation, and that's actually very important for the, um, the argument, but it is, does involve symmetric functions. So here we have um, a symmetric cubic involving cubic and linear terms and a symmetric quadratic. Um, uh, three variables. And so what this theorem does is it gives us a paucity result for this, the solutions of this pair of equations, where clearly solutions where one side is a permutation of the other, um, the x's are a permutation of the y's, and then the number of non-diagonal terms is clearly smaller. That's not so surprising as the total degree of the system is five for six variables, so not too surprising maybe. Okay, so let's um, give a, an idea of a proof of this. It's, it's kind of a nice um, topic for a 25 minute talk because um, you can really prove everything in 25 minutes and see what's going on. Um, so the first proof for large degree fader, which includes the transcendental case, that's degree infinity, um, is very simple to describe on one page. So we can rewrite our equation. She's doing the counting for us. Um, we can rewrite that in terms of elementary symmetric polynomials. And in fact, just by comparing these two displays here, displayed equations, you get the definition of the elementary symmetric polynomials. So, excellent. So, um, so we can now examine the coefficients of all of the powers of theta. And because these um, powers of theta, one theta up to theta to the k minus one, are linearly independent over the rationals, because I made sure that the degree of theta was large enough, then all of these symmetric polynomials have to match in pairs for the polynomials with respect to x and those with respect to the y's, which means that I can write down a polynomial identity connecting the variables. And um, these polynomials must have um, the same roots uh, with the same multiplicities um, on left and right hand sides. So the x's are a permutation of the y's. So there you go, Bob's your uncle, you proved the first theorem. Um, so that's of course very simple, and it, it is just using um, linear independence, sufficient linear independence of, of everything. And it shows, by the way, that you know when theta is transcendental, for example, um, these shifted integers really bear very little relation to uh, shifted natural to, to natural numbers of rational situation, very different situation. Okay, so let's look at the small degree situation. That's, that's more challenging. So now let's assume that theta is um, algebraic of degree um, somewhere between two, but strictly smaller than k. Um, and let's look at a typical solution of this, um, this equation. Um, now, um, I'm gonna exclude all the solutions where the x's are actually a permutation of the y's, those are trivial somehow. It doesn't take much. You can sort of um, situation any one of the x i's is equal to any one of the y j's. So we can assume that, that no um, x i is equal to a y j for any i or j. Okay. So that's motivated maybe by the last argument. Look at the um, the difference between the product of t plus x i and the product of t. So this polynomial, you know, the t to the k is cancelled, so it's a polynomial of degree at most k minus one. So we can write down this polynomial using coefficients, a sub i. 
And these polynomials, you know, because the variables are all at most x, you know, capital X in size, the coefficients are bounded by um, the j coefficient by x to the k minus j. Not too surprising. Okay, so, um, so one strategy, so this is a sort of wishful thinking maybe, but if we could show that there are not that many choices for the a sub i's, then we could just um, fix any one of the available choices for the a sub j's. If there were happened to be at most big O of x to the k minus two of them, that would be fine. Um, because then if we fixed a uh, choice for t, set t to be minus yj, say, then you can see that the right-hand side in this top display, the right-hand term, uh, product of t plus yi, that would vanish. And we'd end up with um, this polynomial evaluated at minus yj in the product of the xi's minus yj's. Um, and because we're assuming in this wishful thinking that the not many choices for the i's, that would mean that there would be at most big of x to the k minus one uh, integers available as we look at the possible solution. Um, those integers would be the product of xi minus yj. So a divisor function estimate would show that um, a big O of x to the epsilon possible choices for all these differences, x, xi minus yj. Um, yj is already fixed, so you get all the x's, and then you can obtain all the y's from this by symmetrical argument. So a big O of x to the k minus one plus epsilon solutions altogether, which is smaller than the diagonal contribution. <clears throat> so we're looking for an argument which would do something like, like that. Okay, well, <clears throat> somehow we have to use the fact that this fader is algebraic of small degree. And if you see something involving algebraic numbers of small degree, maybe you should think of everything you learned in your basic uh, elementary algebra classes or Galois theory classes, whatever you did. So let's look at the minimal polynomial of fader. And I want this to be an integer uh, polynomial of int with integer coefficients. So I'll, I'll um, this is not maybe not quite the uh, formal minimal polynomial that you looked at, um, but I adjust it by a leading coefficient. So if you divide by the leading coefficient of this particular polynomial, um, so that it's monic, then you would get the usual minimal polynomial of a Q. So all these coefficients depend at most on, uh, on theta, of course. And, um, and one observation about this polynomial capital F that we have <clears throat> is that it vanishes when I fix T to be theta. Because after all, we've got a solution of the product of Xi plus theta equal to a product of Yi plus theta. So F of theta is zero, which means that this minimal polynomial divides F of T. And that means that there's a quotient polynomial um, C of t with integer coefficients, um, which when I multiply it by the minimal polynomial gives me capital F again. Okay, so, um, so that's a useful observation and it constrains all of the coefficients. So, so if you play with this, I mean, this, this new polynomial C, um, its coefficients don't grow too rapidly. If you play around with this, and I don't go through the details here, um, we can check that uh, if you look at the, the highest degree terms, the coefficient of the highest degree term in C is big O of x. Uh, x highest degree term is big O of x squared and so on. So, so this quotient polynomial has coefficients which are too big. And now we can play a similar game to what we played in the, um, the, sort of the outline, the dream proof. Um, so if I fix, um, T to be minus yj, then what I get is a polynomial identity involving product of the xi minus yj's. That's equal to the minimal polynomial evaluated at minus yj times this quotient polynomial evaluated at minus yj. And that quotient polynomial, you can check because yj is at most x, is not too big. It's bigger of x to the k minus d. d is the degree of theta, remember. And so that means that I've got some nice polynomial identity. I could fix any one of the possible choices for this C of minus yj, big O of x to the k minus d choices, the big O of x choices for this minimal polynomial evaluated at 
minus yj because for a big R of x choice is for yj. And that means that um, the number of choices for, um, for the product on the left hand side here is big R of x to the uh, k minus d plus one. So now I can use the divisor function estimate to see that um, the big R of x to epsilon choices for all of the xi minus yj's for this fixed choice of yj. And I can um, reverse the, uh, the course of the argument. You know, now yj is fixed, all the xi's I can consider to be fixed. I can uh, find all the, all the remaining y's by again using a divisor function argument there using the symmetry of the, the argument. So, um, so that would be one of Possibility. There's another possibility which I, I mentioned because it uh, leads into one of the high order divisor estimates that I mentioned earlier. Um, as soon as I've fixed all the x's uh, and the fixed choice of the y's, I can just take norms down to the rationals in the original equation. I get some product of minimal polynomials evaluated at all of these variables. And again, a divisor function estimate would fix all the remaining y's for me. So, um, so either way, you can see that uh, the fixed choice of, uh, of this integer rho j, which I mentioned before, and a fixed yj, uh, big O of x to the k minus d plus one choices there, the uh, big O of x to the epsilon choices for all of these divisors which occur. And by then we've determined everything. Um, so one wrinkle in this is, of course, you may get oops, um, you may get um, uh, products of these differences, which is zero. But we excluded all of those sort of diagonal situations. So, so that's uh, that's why we get rid of all this, this diagonal contribution. Um, and as long as theta has degree which is at least two, in other words, theta is not rational, then definitely going to an upper bound for the number of non-diagonal solutions, which is of small order of magnitude than the diagonal contribution, which grows like k factorial extension. So it's a pretty simple argument. And one of the key aspects is there's a lot of constraint coming from the fact that theta is algebraic. Um, so I wanted to say a few words in the remaining three minutes about um, generalizations. Um, so, so I got into this. Um, well, I've been thinking about paucity problems for 25 years, at least. Um, and uh, this all goes back to early work of Humi on sums of two cubes. Um, and uh, so one problem I've spent a lot of time looking at are, are problems related to Vinogradov systems. So there's a Vinogradov system of equations where um, we've got equations, sums of powers of degree one up to k where you're missing one of the degrees. And here you get a paucity problem, so there are diagonal solutions, tk of x diagonal solutions. Then the number of off diagonal solutions grows, in fact, much more slowly, provided that the missing degree is pretty close to k. Um, but in all of these problems, um, the, the number of equations is very close to the number of pairs of variables. So the number of pairs of variables in the system is, is um, well, k. Probably correctly, but the number of variables is, is 2k. So the number of pairs of variables is k. The number of equations is k minus one. So <clears throat> these differ by, by just two here. And it'd be much more interesting, certainly um, something which one has very few results about. Um, going beyond this kind of limit where you have many more variables and equations. And the situation we were just looking at is one situation of that type. Um, and what I was looking at um, when I got contacted by, uh, by Winston and uh, Anirak was um, situations where you do go beyond this limit, um, but not quite in the decisive way which you saw in the, the discussion earlier. So I thought I'd say uh, a couple of words about this in the remaining one minute. Um, so, uh, so here we have um, polynomials, which are linear combinations of symmetric polynomials. So when you look at this, you see um, we've got 
um, symmetric polynomials of degree r up to k or r plus one up to k with some some extra um, linear combination of symmetric polynomials thrown in these extra linear these extra symmetric polynomials have small degree and we look at a system of uh, equations of this type we've got um, k minus r equations now and k variables and so the theorem that we get to prove is that you're dominated by the diagonal contribution as long as r times r plus one is at most two times k minus two so now r could be as big as square root of k and, uh, and we would still get this diagonal contribution um, and maybe i won't say too much about this i mean the, the key idea is to um, give yourself the freedom to choose these low degree symmetric polynomial differences um, and use that to encode all of the solutions of the system um, and then use this nice polynomial identity again um, because you made sure that the few choices for these three parameters each by the choice of a system, it means that, um, again, uh, the few choices for this polynomial capital F, and uh, you can use a divisor function, a uh, divisor estimate once again, to bound the number of choices for the differences by joining this XI. Okay, good. So, um, so in my remaining minus one minute, um, you can generalize all this. Um, you don't have to have uh, consecutive small degrees. You can um, play around with that a little bit. As long as you don't have a uh, sum of degrees, which is too large for these sort of omitted degrees. And uh, I wanted to emphasize the, the reason why the shifted integer divisor problem does so much better is because you've got a lot of rigidity for these algebraic relations. That's the end. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.